What's going on, folks? Your boy again, Dr. Sean Thomas, back in the building with the Be More Today show. We are back. We are back. We are back in the building. And folks, we are in the month of October. Happy PT month, my favorite month of the year, highlighting all the PTs that are great in this world. And we have so much to talk about on today's show. Before we get into that, Be More Today, as you know, is a movement. Uh, BeMoreTraining.com has all your information for my book, for our more merch store, um, our information for our swag store. Uh, of course, we're on Instagram and on Facebook, BeMoreToday.com. Uh, for all those things, be more today underscore PT, be more today underscore show. And of course, your boy here at Dr. Sean Thomas for all your PT and running needs. I'm your guy. This show has grown so much in the last four years, folks. We are now heard in 80 countries, over 52,000 downloads. And again, thanks to your love and support that we continue to be here inspiring people to be not just ordinary, but to be extraordinary in what they're doing. So I appreciate you. Your love and support does not go unnoticed. Our quote for today is simple as always. Compete with others and you'll become bitter. Compete with yourself and you'll become better. Now we're in the month of October. The year is slowly coming to an end. And this whole year, we've been doing a lot of things, uh, focusing on challenges, my step challenge that uh, continues to go on. And there's so many things that I had planned for my life for this year. Um, and I look back on my life as being a PT for the last, geez, 12 years. Um, it's been a great experience. And I've seen myself grow so much. I've seen myself um, grow as a clinician, but also as a person. This is a really uh, humanitarian-based profession where you get to learn so many people and, and, and the nuances and their traits and their cultures and so many things. And it's great, but there is this constant need to continue to be better at your craft because people keep changing and science keeps changing. And although some things are the same, you want to be the best clinician that you can be. And I found myself just trying to find more ways to be effective for my patients, effective as a clinician, as a director, as a leader, all these different things. And I continue to grow in, in that. But my guest on today's show is the embodiment of helping others to do that same thing. And I want to just inspire you, whether you're a PT like me, or you're someone who's in the healthcare profession, or even in your own craft, just to go out there and not compete against others, but to really make sure you compete against yourself to be better, not just for you, but for those who you are serving, those you, you're giving back to. And my guest on today's show is basically the environment of that. His name is Jonathan Elias, and he graduated from SUNY Downstate, my alma mater, uh, in 2013 and began his career in outpatient orthopedic practice. In 2017, Jonathan be became a board-certified orthopedic specialist. Jonathan is also an adjunct professor at the College of Staten Island Physical Therapy Program with a focus on orthopedic practice and therapeutic exercise. Other practices interests include differential diagnosis, vestibular evaluation and treatment, return to sport treatment, post-operative care, and other things. Jonathan has also worked with other organizations to give guest lectures and in-services. And when not treating folks or teaching, Jonathan performs both stand-up and improv comedy, which I'm excited to hear a little bit about that today. So folks, for PT Month, ladies and gentlemen, Boys and girls, pets included, please welcome to the stage our second guest for PT Month, my friend, Jonathan Elias. Jonathan, what is going on? It's going, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Listen, no problem. I, I, As I'm going back, looking at the wheels now, and I'm seeing that you graduated from 13 or 13 from Downstate, and I graduated 11, I'm surprised our paths didn't cross. And if they did cross, there was no real introduction because we didn't know each other, you know? Um, but it's great to know that you're also a, a, a downstate alum as I am, and you know the struggles and the and the beauties and the experiences that downstate was and is. So we have that in common already. So I appreciate you so much. Absolutely, thank you for having me. It's it's actually funny you said that because downstate grads I tend to notice typically stick together. You find them and you find them almost in clusters. Yeah, uh, with specific companies. Yeah, so. no, it's true. It's true. I don't even know how it works, but uh, there are so many downstate alums at our company, Jag One, and uh, we all have a similar treatment style or a similar mantra, if you will. So I, I think it's definitely a thing. I think yeah, they taught us. They taught us well, I hope. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Listen, Jonathan, you know, I've admired you from far for a long time. Um, 
uh, before I even get into, you know, what you do, I just wanted to say that I appreciate you as a person. Um, I've seen you do a number of things when it comes to clinical education. And uh, whenever someone's struggling with something when it comes to the clinical side of, of physical therapy, or even looking at board exam studying or anything like that, the first thing that comes up is yours. And that's how it's been since I started working at this company, uh, you know, 11 years ago, and that's how it continues to be at this time. So do you mind just sharing with the listeners, you know, who you are in terms of your um, your role at Jaguar Physical Therapy and what that entails? All right. So I am the director of clinical education here alongside a partner uh, of mine, Christy Raz. Uh, but pretty much our job as the clinical education director is to teach, right? That's the whole point. We uh, we happen to be in a profession where we're supposed to be lifelong learners. So we're here to kind of facilitate that. Um, and it kind of, you kind of split it up into three categories, right? You have your new grads, right? And they kind of deal in with our mentorship program. And that's kind of dialing it down and kind of providing them with, with slightly above basic knowledge so that they can begin their journey to, to inspire them almost to continue to learn. Right. Uh, and also have them treat a little better as they kind of go. And then you have your intermediate folk, the the ones that have been in the game three to five years. Uh, and then we got to keep them engaged and interested. And then we'll bring in kind of new techniques so that they don't feel like they're stale in their own treatment. Uh, and then you have your, your specialists and your veterans and kind of getting them uh, more advanced and kind of convincing them to, you know, want to specialize in a field that they might find more interesting. So uh, we kind of facilitate that by doing clinical education series. We do that by uh, setting up CEU courses for the company. Uh, we also do that with our new grads by putting them in our mentorship program, which, which typically lasts a year long, where they communicate with me and their mentor that is placed for them in clinic, uh, where they can kind of just bounce ideas off of. We're trying to we're trying to almost garner the conversation, right? Uh, which you may or may not see as much anymore, but the conversation of just talking shop, you know, getting a, getting together with other PTs, talking, sharing techniques and thoughts and bouncing patient ideas off each other. And I, I know you do this all the time. I've, I've seen it firsthand. So it's, it's something that I'm hoping continues to, you know, grow and just keep people interested in this profession without burnout with that and, and just keep people passionate about it. I love it. You know, I, I think so many things when you say those things, I, I feel like for one, as a clinician who's been out, similar time as you've been out, I think there is a, a level of complacency that can come when you become so ingrained in one thing for such a long time, right? We're, we're, we're creatures of habit. So so easily we get so uh, uh, into these rhythms of saying, well, this person has arthritis, I'm going to do these things. This person has uh, shoulder uh, impingement syndrome, I'm going to do those things. So this person has, you know, whatever else, stenosis, I'm going to do those things. And you just fall into these things where it's on autopilot. And I feel like for those three groups you just mentioned, right? You have your new grads who are trying to figure out what they even know, what they remember what's going on. And they're freaking out about all these things and trying to give everybody everything, right? You give the same protocols to every single person. And then you have your vets who are like, you know what? I've done this a thousand times. I'm gonna just give whatever I know. And they worked for Susie Q back in 97. I'm gonna do it for this person now in you know, 05 or, or, or 2013 uh, or 23. And I'm gonna do it for that person as well. And then you have this middle group, like you said, that's trying to figure out, you know, where they want to be. They're still learning from what they see and what, what they're being mentored toward. And, and, and it's so many different things. And I think those three groups are, are great because it gives the overall spectrum of our profession. And as clinicians talking about, you know, PT month, I think it's imperative in your role to really help all of us to just not fall into those complacency bundles where we get so just uh, easy doing the same thing. Or we just get so flustered, we give everyone everything because no one gets better that way. And yeah, the conversations you mentioned that we try to have at our job um, go just like that. You know, we're just trying to figure out how we can talk about, you know, what works for your patient, what works for my patient, what's worked in the past, how we can do things differently. And I feel like, Jonathan, maybe you can help me out with this question that I have. Sometimes as clinicians in this day and age in the health field, in the healthcare field, and what's going on with insurances and time and and there's so many things happening. It's hard to take time out to have these conversations. It's hard to really give good clinical advice on the fly. 
when you're a student, it's totally different, right? Because you, all you have to do is just soak up all the information and then <laughs> there's no pressure. But when you're, you know, talking about deadlines and, and budgets and, and all these things that we have to do with insurances, it's sometimes hard to do that. So what's some advice that you may give to clinicians, not just at JAG1, but at other companies, other PT places where in this healthcare society that we have now, it's sometimes hard to take time out to really carve out quality time for clinicians to talk about better ways to give quality care to our patients. What are some things that you can share with those who are listening that we can do to, to just find more time to do that? So for me, it's honestly, it's about just keeping my eyes and ears open, right? Just kind of seeing what's going around, going on around me, seeing what other clinicians might be doing. Uh, and let's say, for example, another clinician throws in an exercise that I'm like, oh, you know what? That's interesting. I'm curious to know why they're doing that. You know, the conversations don't have to be carved out hour long break room conversations, right? You just, you know, you step aside. Oh, I saw so-and-so doing that. Well, what was your rationale there? Why did we do that? Or if I notice a clinician, you know, scratching their head a little bit about a diagnosis, same thing, go up to their five, 10 minute conversation and just say, hey, what did, what did you notice with this person? Maybe we tried this. Maybe we don't worry so much about that. Um, and it's just honestly being present and attentive to what's going around on around you. It's not a, I always say it's not a situation where you have to carve out time and have, have meetings about this with staff members and everything like that. It's just, it's feeling passionate enough to just want to talk shop. You're genuinely interested in what is going on around you. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I think that's, that's good. I, I think the, the challenging part for me is that I don't know if everyone is in that same boat of wanting <laughs> to be passionate about that shop conversation. Um, I feel like there's some PTs who say, you know what? I'm out. <laughs> it's, it's one yeah. o'clock. I'll see y'all. I got to do this, that, and the third. And there's some people who love it. I mean, you're you're also an adjunct professor. So there's a part of you, I'm sure, that likes that cerebral uh, uh, component of what we do as clinicians. I'm sure you like teaching or at least be able to show the process to others of how to diagnose a patient, how to walk through the signs and symptoms of a different diagnosis situation. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just thinking, you know, the, the people that I know that are in these th positions where they are teaching to some extent, either as an adjunct or in some kind of a job position, there's a certain uh, um, enthusiasm that comes with being able to share that information with someone else, especially if they're younger uh, or, or a newer grad, and then to watch them have that same process to give other patients that same uh, uh, benefit in the end. Is that is that true for you? Is that why you got into this this position in terms of directing and, and teaching the clinical side at JAG1? So I got into teaching after, like right after I got became a uh, certified specialist because I was thinking to myself and I'm like, well, what now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what can I do uh, to just keep myself engaged? Uh, so I decided to, you know, I applied over to College of Staten Island. They brought me in to start teaching and I feel like it's a nice way of seeing the entire spectrum of PT from beginning, the whole timeline, from beginning pre-graduating all the way now till their veteran therapist. Uh, and the enjoyment I get out of it is kind of, it, I feel like it is almost my way of giving back to the profession, right? Because how many, how many new grads do we see coming out? And like you said, they're like, well, this is a shoulder, right? And that's the most they could tell us about it. So right. This will uh, this this way. It's I feel like I could also help prep a you know a certain group of people to be ready for what's out there. And it's not just the it's not just the academics, right? It's kind of garnering the personality that comes with being a PT. Yeah, right. It's the you know have it's the helping them understand because as a as a new PT or a student PT, you have very little patient interaction, if any, until a certain point. So I don't understand how important just having that interpersonal relationship with a patient is. And you can't, I feel bad almost throwing someone out there who hasn't had the conversation of just building a rapport with your patient, building a, a, a trusting relationship. Uh, and I feel like that goes, that goes very far, uh, especially at that level. Yeah. And that's kind of what I try to teach is it's not just what we know. It's how did you take what your client is talking about, what their deficits are, they're in their vulnerable position and how do we help them get better? Yeah, uh, and, and that to me is what kind of got me into teaching and kept me in teaching. Yeah. Supposed to be you know, able to teach. Funny. You know, it's funny. I, I, I never 
as I've done this show now for the last four years, I never thought of myself as a teacher at all. I, I always, oh, I'm not a teacher. I'm not, a teacher. I don't teach. You're, you're but, a teacher. So. <laughs> yeah, it, it's true. It's true. I've, I've embraced it. We, we all are teachers, right? If you're a clinician or a healthcare professional, we teach every single day. And it's something that I, I've finally um, accepted and walked into, and, and I'm, I'm just embracing that thing. But you as a professor now, being able to teach so many um, before they even come into the workforce, you know, I'm curious for you if you see certain trends in terms of um, students not being able to understand how important, like he just said, that one-on-one -on -one interaction is. Because I think sometimes as clinicians, we know all these things about the body. You know, that's, that's what we do. We are movement specialists. When it comes to uh, musculoskeletal issues and other things like that, vestibular, whatever else, that's us. This is what we do. And I think that every student who comes out of a PT practice or a PT uh, program has a good understanding of those things. What I think is lacking, and correct me if I'm wrong, because again, you see students, um, and we, ha we have interns clearly, right? But you see students when they're in the classroom setting. I feel like a lot of the clinicians that I've seen, and not just uh, at JAG1, but across the spectrum, just the PT spectrum now, in terms of where we are 2023, the compassion and the ability to relate to people is different than I think than when you and I were in school. And even those who came before us when they were in school, I, I talked to a senior therapists who were treating you know, for 20, 30 years. And the rapport they have with their patients is a little different than what I see now with, with the, the newer generation, the, the newer graduates. I'm even talking not just about the, the, the personal side, but also the clinical side, right? There are differences in terms of, uh, you know, we used to put hot packs and, and uh, modalities on everybody, you know? new generation that says, you know what, scratch the heat, we're going to get into this, or we're going to, you know, they're just doing things differently. And the rationale for those things, there's ra there's ra the rationales for those things as well. So I'm curious for you, as you've seen now just your own experience as a clinician, and now that you're seeing the newer graduates coming in and the differences in terms of what is the standard or the baseline for patient-client management, for clinical acceptance, you know, what are your thoughts on the differences in terms of um, what you're seeing in the classroom, what you're seeing for new grads coming out, and where you see the professions going as as you're kind of in the the trenches now as a as a professor, but also you know working as a clinician as well. Uh, I think the shift kind of happened where veteran PTs, you know, it was a it was a different society, right? Social interaction in general is different now. So what do we see? We see a lot of we see a lot of the younger, I guess, group. They come out of school and they know what they know and you know they're for a majority of them are they have the knowledge the problem is being able to engage with an with an, another person right now everything is at our fingertips including socialization uh so a lot of times especially during the past three years right a lot of socialization happened over the computer or through a computer screen uh it's almost like people forgot how to converse in person and you can't, you, you could be the best PT in the world. You could have all the knowledge in the world, but if you can't have, if you can't engage with your patient appropriately, uh, they're not going to necessarily give you all the details you need to then come up with the best possible program. Like how many times you talk to your patient all of a sudden they say something and you're like, oh, well, that's important in your life. Now let me do something to help you with that. Uh, and that is something I'm seeing is lacking in the newer generation coming out that, like I said, they have, they have more information than we did. Uh, they know a lot more. Uh, but once again, that, that patient interaction uh, sometimes gets muddied a little bit because they're so strictly, you know, strictly business focused. You're weak. I'm going to get you stronger. Let's move on. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree with you. And I, I'm glad you, you actually, you verbalized it better than I did. And it's true. I, I think that's what is missing. And that's what I've been seeing, not just, you know, across where, where we work, but across the general scope of PT across the country. Um, and maybe it was COVID, you know, maybe it was a number of different things, maybe it's technology, who knows? I don't know. But I do think that's something that we should be able to address, hopefully moving forward, just give better quality to our patients. And, you know, I'm curious, because now I, I know that a lot of people see you and I see others who are in these adjunct professor positions and they want to they want to teach they want to do so many things outside of the classroom what would be your advice to tell someone when they should take that leap into 
the teaching realm, or even if they should take that leap into the teaching realm? It really comes down to confidence. Like I know when I graduated my first three years, if you were like, you know, John, you're going to teach one day. I was like, no, I'm not. That's, that's foolish. Right. Um, when you, when you get to a point where you're comfortable with your own skill set and treatment, that's the time to kind of jump into it. Uh, because you have, I mean, they're going to, you're going to get assigned a class, right? You're going to teach that class. You're almost, to be honest, part of the class, you're going to have to reteach yourself. I know I did. When I originally came out, I was a modalities professor. Uh, and I'm not exactly a, a huge user of modalities. So I had to literally go reteach myself a lot of a lot of that. And to be honest, I, I like the idea of keeping myself on my toes, getting get forcing myself into that kind of position where I had to relearn. And so I didn't forget the basics. So to me, that's part of that's what teaching gives me. It keeps me back on my toes. And I think everyone, honestly, if you feel like you're up for it even a little bit then you should at least make the attempt because you don't necessarily have to be a primary course professor either. You could be a co-teacher, you could be a TA, uh, lab assistant in general. So it's not like you're getting thrown in there. Now, all of a sudden you got your own course alone. Most programs will set you up first as a lab assistant uh, to get you used to teaching and yeah. being able to share that experience. Um, I believe you told me before you were doing some, uh, adjunct thing you did you did a class yourself what was your experience with that yeah so i did an adjunct class at downstate our alma mater um actually did it sometime last year i was ever happy to do it uh it was actually a lot of fun uh it was just one class though i didn't do like a a whole semester or anything but you know i gotta say i did really enjoy being in the classroom and being able to share uh the experience that i have as a clinician but also looking at it was a third year class so being able to remember when i was a third year uh what i knew or thought i knew and then what the realities that are really out there and being able to really talk about those two things it was great answer some questions about real life scenarios and it was really really fun i really enjoyed my experience and you know i i do a number of different um presentations for you know community boards and churches or whatever else and i'm always teaching whether it's my fitness class or what have you i, I love doing those kind of things fall preventions online you know whatever else but I do think there is a, a like you said, a, a give back um, that comes when you can share the information that you have. Again, it's not rocket science. I say all the time, but there are a lot of things that we can share with people that can enhance their lives. And they we can't always assume that they know because most of the time they don't know these simple yeah. things about hot versus cold, you know, about how to go downstairs properly, about fall prevention, about all these different things that we take for granted. Being able to share those things and that wealth of knowledge with others and even with our students who are coming out to share it with other patients in the future, they're gems. Um, they're gems. And, you know, I, it's funny because everybody, I, sometimes I'm sure you probably have the same thing whenever you go out and you're probably in a group of friends that don't know who you are or what you do. As soon as you mention that you're a therapist, all of a sudden somebody's arm hurts, their leg hurts, their back hurts, and they have a thousand questions for you. And I, I think that's part of the the beauty of it that makes me always smile, but it's also part of the the question that always goes in the back of my mind. Of, oh wow, you know, some people just don't know. Yeah, basic yeah. things that we've been you know been ingrained in us for the last you know 15, 15 years. So it's great to share it. It's great to share it. Great to share it. That's that's always my favorite, right? You're at a you're at a family function or a party, and now you got a, a line as if as if you're treating that day a whole caseload ready for you right next to the nachos, you know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's like okay, we're doing this now, no problem. Just, come on up, yeah. <laughs> Jonathan, I have actually a very important question for you, and this I've talked about this on the show. I've actually talked about it in my book before. Um, the national board exam. Uh, one of the, I think, most challenging exams uh, in the country, if not in the world. And you can give me your thoughts on that because you clearly have experience in terms of helping others with it. Um, but I know it's, it's been a, a point of contention and also a, a roadblock for many, many PTs, um, not just new grads. Uh, people who graduated years before have also struggled, including myself, struggling with the board exam and not taking or not passing it on their first, second, third, sometimes even fourth time. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on the the difficulty or what or why you think it's so hard for some people to pass this thing. And 
what your thoughts are on our exam compared to other healthcare professionals like nursing, um, you know, even MDs with, with their um, different levels or different steps. What are your thoughts on why our MPT is so challenging and, and how does it compare to other professions? So when it comes to the NPT right now, because we saw a dramatic decrease in the pass rate within the past year or two years, it's because they're changing the test. They've changed the focus of the test. And honestly, it takes a little bit of time for curriculums to catch up. And then once the curriculums catch up, study guides need to catch up that people use uh, <clears throat> use to kind of you know prep for the exam. So we're seeing a shift where they're taking out... Uh, some of the things we once found to be more important, some of the maybe orthopedic things or or the general practice things. And they're adding a lot of that other systems category, right? A lot about uh, visceral structures, organ-based systems. And the they learn that these, these newer PTs and newer grads, they learn it in school, but there wasn't really too much emphasis on it. It was like, oh, here's this kidney dysfunction. This is how it affects your body. Let's move on to the next. Whereas on your NPTE, now they're asking. They're asking questions that may not be super detailed about it, but now we're expecting that person to kind of remember back to a two minute period in one of their classes to now answer this when their study guides have been focusing on, you know, this special test or this situation, who do you contact, like that kind of stuff. So we're seeing a shift with without giving them the ability to have an appropriate prep, all right? So we usually talk about studying for the boards for six weeks. And I know uh, some newer PTs now who have taken and uh, unfortunately failed. And I know they've been studying and I know they're also strong, strong students. Um, there's just a little bit of a disconnect. I do feel, however, I try to spin a positive out of, out of it. Do I think it's necessarily a bad thing? In, in a way, I think it allows us to have a little more autonomy in our profession. Right. It allows it does. It makes us a little more or at least tries to prove our reliability out there uh, in a sense of, you know, because a lot of our things are physician based. Right. Going to see a physician, get your referral, come see us if they think they need PT. Uh, I think this is a, it's a step towards our autonomy. Do I necessarily like the rollout that came with it? Not particularly because the, the test itself, by the time prep courses and everything kind of catch up. You're looking at probably a whole nother year or two years of cycles. Um, and don't get me wrong, the prep, the prep courses do touch on these topics, but now since the focus has shifted, they're also not seeing the test yet. Like prep courses don't get tests immediately. So we have to wait for the prep course to get an older test that has the information for them to then rewrite their prep course. You also has a test that you also have a test that's changed, if I'm not mistaken, twice over the past year and a half. So even when that test is available, it's still not the most updated test. Uh, and you know, now they're changing it so that it's a couple less questions, you know, they have a little less time on the exam. Um, so it really, like I said, they keep they're, if they're changing it right now, they're almost in a in an experimental phase of just changing it to how they want it. And I don't think uh, prep courses and, and course curriculums and schools are keeping up with it per se, just putting and not saying, you know, as far as schools, curriculum could stay exactly the same. It's where you put your emphasis. Right. So I, mean, I, I I've shared this on the show a number of times. It's actually in my book. Also, I took my board exam more times than expected. Um, I, I took my board exam 11 or well, 12 times. Um, I, I failed 11 times, it took it 12 times. And as I look back on it now, you know, I don't really remember the stress that was on my shoulders. Uh, I remember the money I was spent to, to pay for the test to sit for the test, but the actual stress of going through it, I don't really remember, but I know during that four year period, cause it was a four year period from, I graduated in 11 until 2015. I took it for four years. I took it three times. Uh, a year for four years straight. And on that 12th time, and this is before they changed the rules for, mm -hmm. um, I guess it's six or four or six, maybe is the max. I think six times you could take it three in a row. Right. So this is, this is before there was any kind of limit. It was like, yeah, we want your money. Take it as many times as you want. We got you. <laughs> it's all good. 
And uh, I kept taking it every year. And, you know, the first couple of times I, I, I remember taking it, I was like, I got married, it was a honeymoon. I took it like between the two, like, oh, it's gonna be fine. I didn't take it seriously enough. And as I was taking it more and more, I said, you know what, this doesn't feel right. Like I'm I'm studying, but it's not, I'm not seeing any improvement. So I took a course. And this is before there was like front of frontier or whatever there is now. There were no courses really that I remember at that time. And you can remember as well, probably. There weren't any real courses. We had score builders and you know, the therapy books that we use. Right, exactly. Therapy ed, right. But there were no like, courses to take. So there was this one course that I found. With this one guy, his name was Jim. It was a course that I don't even know how we found it, but this guy was amazing. And he basically outlined, not even the test per se, but just like showed you how to attack the questions from their perspective. So that whatever they threw at you, you'd be able to figure it out. Because they are tricky, right? But he gave us the basically outline. Everything was outlines. And he just did outlines, outlines, outlines. And then part two was just doing questions. And that course saved me and saved a number of my friends, a number of our clinicians who actually go to JAG1, took that same course. And then COVID happened and that course was uh, diminished. It stops. I don't even know where he is anymore. So, so you hit the nail on the head with that when you were talking about how to attack a question. And that is something that gets lost. Right. The, way, the way questions are written on the NPTE, all the information is in the question. You yeah. just got to peel it out and find it. They also add some fluff to kind of throw it, throw some extra stuff in there. So as long as, if you're able to determine what is important and relevant information to the question versus what's not, you've gotten a majority of the question, uh, like you have, you're you're almost there, right? Now it's just take out two answers because we know that's how they do it. Two answers pretty much could get thrown out and then you have to choose the best answer. Once you're able to break that whole thing down and once you learn how to read the questions, the test changes for you, it changes for a person. This is what I tell all my students going into the exam. It's not like you spent, you had three years learning the information, right? Right. Now it's how do we integrate it and how do we read those questions so that you can actually answer with the information that you know, you probably know. Uh, but much as, as is all standardized testing, you know, there's little tips and tricks that you kind of just have to get through. And, and I can't even tell you how many. PTs I've seen fail by, you know, one question, two questions, anything under anything under 20 questions to me is like, or 10 questions is, you know, you were right there. If we could just change these minor details, yeah, you can pass this exam. Yeah, yeah. And that's exactly where I was. I was like missing by a point, two points, three points, and it was the same thing. But I agree with you. The, the questions do, do help and just find ways to do it. What are your tips, if any, can you share with you know, those who are coming out who are still struggling or those who haven't taken the test yet, but like, yo, this thing sounds kind of crazy. What should I do to prepare for this thing? Any tips that you want to share with aspiring, I guess, third years who are coming out or even PTs who have been out for a minute, but are struggling still with this, this MPT? Uh, in my opinion, it kind of comes down to that test is your career, right? That test is probably, it's the most important thing you should be worrying about for X amount of time, however much you lay out for yourself. A lot of times we say, uh, a lot of times we tell our students six weeks, you know, from graduation to the first exam. But I feel like you should be studying before that. I feel like, like when I took my NPTE, and granted it was a very different test, I started studying during my last clinical. So I was in clinic, say April, right? Uh, I gave myself an additional 60 days to be able to go through information and then go through it at a at a pace that allowed me to still live my life and feel confident. And that's what, and that's what it is. We stress so much for six weeks mm. to study for this thing. You know, we, we lose out on everyday life and things that actually calm us and relax us. Uh, and that added stress makes you, in my opinion, retain less information. You're mm. not studying as hard. So it's figure out a good, like best advice I could figure out a good study schedule for you. You know, a couple hours a day, two, three hours a day, extend it. Don't make it a six week time period so that you can find your deficits and then work on those, especially, especially kind of when it's game time, when you're within that month, mm -hmm. right? Kind of focus in on your studying and then also find something else to do that is just not PT related. 
whether it's, you know, fitness, going going and hanging out, you know, hanging out with family, doing whatever. Like me, a, a big thing for me, and as you mentioned in the beginning, was doing stand-up and improv. That was my retreat from studying. And that was, uh, unfortunately, that was also my income at the time. But it was, uh, it's, uh, it was just one of those things that just take my mind off of it completely and then come back to it with fresh eyes the next day. Hmm. so figure out whatever that is for people a lot of pts we're you know we're fitness people so a lot of people like to go work out whatever and that is your time to not think about the exam yeah and relieve that stress so that would be those would be my biggest tips and then obviously you know take a course and know how to answer questions which courses typically answer right right and there seem to be more courses now than ever before um i mean I didn't, we didn't have very expensive courses <laughs> very expensive right. Right. But I think, you know, even talking to some of the, the, the new grads, they, they, they bring up the, the financial piece and then they, they get very, oh, I don't know. And like you said, I mean, this, this is it. Like <laughs> you, you did three years of all these different things. You did four years of undergrad, three years of grad school, all the things you had to do just to get to this point and, and to not invest in, in this last step. There's, it's, it's no brainer for them. I mean, for me, like I said, I took, it didn't matter to me. I'm taking a test for the eighth time, ninth time, I there was no stopping me for that because I knew I had come so far to stop here would be just the worst thing in the world. Doesn't make any there's, sense. There's going. not much you could do, right? right? There's not much you could do in the profession without <laughs> passing that exam. So for me, I look at it as like, yeah, well, you know, you spent uh, 150K in loans or you have 150K in loans so that you could go to that school that was away and dorm and, you right. know, have that experience. You know, a couple hundred to a thousand shouldn't be... Uh, the end of the world when it comes to your career, your your entire future, unfortunately, is built on this exam, which I have my own thoughts on. I'm not a huge fan of that, mm -hmm. uh, especially since they now put a limitation on how many times you could take it. Right. Uh, whereas other professions, it's not like that. Other professions, it's more, you know, just keep taking it, see what happens. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like the the bar exam, I'm I'm not 100 percent sure if it changed, but I remember back when you know. My brother took it. It was, yeah, just take the bar, right? Just go and take the bar. Keep taking it. Whatever. Same thing like it was with us with the NPTE. Yeah. Um, but now that they just put this strict six limit, right? It's like you take it three times in a row, then you have to take a cycle off, then you can take it another three times in a row. I just feel like that's a lot of added pressure for nothing, especially for people who may have failed twice and now they're on their third time. It's like, well, if I fail on my third time, now I have to take a cycle off. That's another six months I can't treat or whatever. I can't be a licensed practitioner. Mm -hmm. uh, and that weighs, that weighs on a person, a person emotionally. It, it has to. Yeah, I agree. I, I, just curious. Um, do you think, and I have my own thoughts on this as well. You know, we talk about test anxiety and we talk about all these different things that, that come out of studying for a test that is of this propensity right it's it's a stressful test it's five and a half hours everything in terms of your career lies on this one thing how <laughs> much of that factors into what you think may be some of the decreases in terms of the about the, the rates of passing this thing in the last couple of years i think a majority of test takers have a certain level of anxiety like i'll, I'll even be willing to say 100 percent of test takers have at least a little bit of, of anxiety when it comes to this test the problem is, is what happens when you sit in front of that cubicle, in front of that computer screen, what happens? Because we know stress and anxiety that that's, you know, people talk about how they blank. They completely blank on the test. They leave the test. And now all of a sudden they're like, damn, I knew that answer, right? Why didn't I put it down? And that is that is anxiety and stress related. And like I said, adding, adding a limitation to it, changing the exam the way they did, uh, that all adds up to it. And then once again, studying in that shortened period of time that people typically study in that six weeks, mm -hmm. now there's all this pressure of, or this constant feeling of, I'm not caught up. I'm not caught up in my studying. Uh, so when you sit down, you look at a question and then you, you blank. Uh, and that's, you know, being able to deal with that anxiety, in my opinion, is huge. And, you know, there are professionals that you can go have conversations with about it. Uh, there's no shame in that. Like, you know, there's a whole stigma with going to just have a conversation, talk to a, get a psych eval in that kind of way, just to have a conversation of being able to reduce testing anxiety, which is very real. I don't think the accommodations are fantastic at the moment. 
for for people with test anxiety um because i mean what's the most they could do give you more time right even right. if they do what do you get like an extra hour it's not enough yeah. um so people kind of that's and that's why i stress so much on having something that's not pt related as well because one thing to be stressed for one time period of five hours it's another thing to be stressed for eight weeks straight right so right. Just being able to, and then once you get to the point where you're in the exam, having your own test, having your own strategies to reduce anxiety. Some people like to, you know, I forgot the name of the method, but they'll like name something directly in front of them or, or take five deep breaths. And then, you know, everyone has their own method of it. Personally, I, I'll, I'll never forget this. For my test anxiety during the NPT, I walked in and I remember I looked at the first question. And I'm like, what? what is this? Like, what am I even looking at? This is wild to me. And I have, <laughs> this is going to sound a little weird. I have a blue eraser that used to be about this big uh -huh. and we were allowed to bring pencils and, and right. erase the test. I have used that pencil for every test since high school. And to reduce my testing anxiety, I used to just take the pencil, uh, the, the eraser and just rub right in there. My thumbprint is actually still in it. I still have it. It exists today. <laughs> Wow. Uh, until, but nowadays you can't bring it into exam. So now I just go like this is how I reduce my anxiety. Yeah, there you go. The yeah, there you go. <laughs> but it's just having something. Yeah. Something there, something real in your hand that can help you reduce uh test anxiety. Yeah. No, it's definitely a real thing. That's hilarious to me. I don't have a beard like you do, so I have to maybe like do a hair thing. But um yeah, I think that that's a that's a real thing. And you know, I in full disclosure and transparency, you know, I as I was going through my testing journey, um, I was racking my brain. I was like, come on, this is crazy. Maybe it's maybe it's my vision. I got my eyes checked. I got glasses. I don't need glasses. <laughs> I don't even know where they are. I never even wear them. But I wore them for the test because it, it may have helped me. I, don't, I have no idea. I went to go see a psychiatrist. I did. I saw a psychiatrist once or twice. And we talked about the test. And um, it, it was helpful just being able to verbalize what my thoughts were on it. You know, talking to someone who wasn't my wife, wasn't like a family member, just a complete, you know, non-related person um, who didn't judge me or anything, just wanted to talk about what was going on. And I think all those things helped. Um, so it's, it's hard to say what's going to help for you or for whoever that person may be. But I do think looking into those things can help make the entire experience, if, it's, if you need it to be better for you. So for sure. I, I just wanted to say, you know, I, I think that a lot of people also, and I'm just thinking about how I felt taking it, they feel like it defines them. And it, it does not like, you know, this is just it is a test. It's a not test. And once you pass that test, you're still a person, you're still a PT, you're still, you know, you're still smart, you're still all these different things. It doesn't define who you are as a person. It just defines how you are as a test taker. <laughs> and that's, that is all it is. That's it. it. How you are as a test taker. That's yeah. it. And then when there's you so many clinicians that I know who are phenomenal PTs, like I I look up to them and everything. It's like you're one of them, Sean. Where I just look up and I'm just like, wow, they're a great PT. How did one test do this? Right? Like it's it's one test determined whether or not they would be able to do this. And to me, that I that is what I find to be a little unreal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Completely understand that and completely agree with you. Um, listen, Jonathan, I, I know that, um, you know, this show has been a show that we highlight people who are doing extraordinary things and, and you're pretty much the embodiment of that. I, I love everything about you and what you're doing and, and sharing the wealth of knowledge with others. And the Be More Today show has been featuring so many people who are doing extraordinary things in their own professions. And that phrase, Be More Today, is a phrase that we always use. So, I'm curious for you, when you hear the phrase be more today, what does that phrase mean to you? It means progression, just in any aspect of you as a person, just progress something further, you know, like it says, be more today, which means I was better, more better than I was yesterday, right? In some aspect of my life or, or anyone's life, do something that makes you better, that makes you grow. Uh, and that's kind of how I look at it. And it's, and it doesn't have to be within your, within a professional capacity, just, you know, if I sit down and I read an article of anything and I learn something that day, I am a little better than I was yesterday. Yeah. And that's really what it is. It's a, it's a motto for progression. That's the way I look at it. Yeah. I love it. I love it. 
Listen, I gotta, I gotta ask now. Now it's the time. You know, a lot of people did a lot of things in terms of stress reduction, like you said, when they were studying for their board exams. For me, it was sports. I was heavily playing numbers. It was oh, Spartan race. I was doing a lot of Spartan races at that time, which became my my go to, my outlet. And I actually did about twenty of them <laughs> during that four year span of oh, studying. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, because I needed some kind of an outlet. Yeah. But for you, Jonathan, you said your outlet was comedy, and mm -hmm. I'm curious. Uh, what is your go-to joke or, or or routine or one of the things that you continue to share that is something that brings you joy and laughter? Share with us at this time, if you don't mind. Let's see. Hmm. Well, joke writing-wise, I say this all the time, they're, they're more stories. They're stories about my life. So without getting into the joke, because uh, I'm assuming this is more family-friendly of a show, without getting into the joke, uh one of my favorite jokes i've ever written um because i do have a comedy writing partner as well and i remember we were just sitting there and one one day i just had severe writer's block we're, we're bouncing ideas off each other and then i went down to uh to new orleans i had a few shows there uh and when i came back i finally realized like why didn't i write about my flight we're talking about a we're talking about a pilot who came in he was late to the flight and he tells us in the beginning, you know, you, you get on a flight, Sean, and what happens? You have a guy who is literally, he comes on the microphone and he's like, ladies and gentlemen, you know, this is your Captain Neil. We're right. going to take a flight. We are in sunny Florida, two and a half hours. Please sit back and enjoy the ride. Mm -hmm. This guy comes on the plane 45 minutes late and he comes on the microphone and he starts off with, oh, hey, guys. <laughs> right. Like he's like, oh, hey, guys, sorry for the late departure, but don't worry. I'll make up the time in the air because I know a shortcut. <laughs> And it was like, and I, <laughs> I can't even tell you, Sean, what this experience was for me. This and and you know, you have the screens, you could see everything. This guy was going eight hundred miles an hour. A normal flight is five hundred. He went eight hundred miles an hour. That is the speed of sound, Sean. What <laughs> what you're hearing right now from me was how fast this man was going in air. And I, I ended up writing this long, like, it's like an eight or nine minute joke. And it, to be honest, I, I use that as my closer a lot. And uh, that is definitely my go-to joke. If anyone starts talking to me about uh, stand-up in general, that's like the joke for me. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. <laughs> Sorry, I'm crying over here. Listen, <laughs> I mean, I can see you were talking about like a car, you know, it's a little different, you know, shortcut I'll take, you know, Remsen Avenue or whatever else. Not in the, what, in the air? No, 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 no. I don't want to hear that. It was an experience. And then at the end, his the microphone that they used, I guess, I don't know if he realized he turned it on, but he was just breathing heavy, right? <laughs> as if as if he himself just ran a race. Right. <laughs> and he, he whispered something, and I could have sworn, I heard him whisper to his co-pilot, like, oh, we made it. Like, <laughs> like, like what? <laughs> I've never had, I've never almost gone into cardiac arrest in... <laughs> <laughs> in such a <laughs> that amount of time the flight instead of being two and a half hours was an hour and five minutes you got oh there you go yeah, yeah. so we so knew a shortcut for sure there you go absolutely <laughs> <laughs> quite the experience quite the experience indeed oh that's crazy well i appreciate life, you. life is comedy right that's what i tell people life, life is comedy life is comedy indeed listen i i, I think the um i think that the fact that you can find comedy and 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 use that to help people in terms of uh, healing, and also use your hands and and your knowledge to help people with healing is is a great tool. And that's what I want to have you on the show, Jonathan, because I think you're a great person, and you have all the components for what Be More Today stands for. And I just appreciate you for being on the show today. You've made this one one for the books. Any any last tips you want to share, or any advice you want to share with listeners about uh, PT, about our profession, about anything as we celebrate uh, National PT Month. You, uh, I guess the the only tip would be keep doing whatever whatever you can to learn. Just because you're a specialist in one area doesn't mean you can't learn more about another. Mm. So keep learning, keep taking those CEUs, uh, no matter what it is. Like uh, like we said in the beginning, one of my interests is vestibular therapy. I'm not a vestibular specialist, but I I enjoy it, so I want to learn about it. I just took a CEU course this past weekend about it, right? Or mm. uh, and I, you know, just always find something new to learn and to get better with. I feel like such a professor now when I say that, like just always, always learn something, always want to learn something and don't lose that passion for that aspect of the job. 
or because yeah. then it gets stale. Yeah, yeah. Words to live by. Words to live by. Now that I appreciate you so much. Thank you for being a part of this uh, celebration for us, our profession, and of course, Jag One, our our company, the best company we have in the Northeast. And I look forward to seeing you in person sometime soon. Sounds good. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I love what you're doing here. So keep going. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, sir. And folks, don't forget what he said. He said so many poignant things. Uh, talking about not giving up, talking about going out there and harnessing and, and honing into your craft, talking about giving back and teaching others what you've learned, and also talking about how you got to have outlets, whether it's comedy, like he used comedy for himself, or whatever your thing's going to be to make sure you can get through your nine to five, your eight to whatever's, just find something that brings you joy and can bring joy to others as well. And I quote for today, again, compete with others and you'll become bitter. Compete with yourself and you'll become better. He said it very, very plainly. Go out there and continue to learn. Keep learning. Keep growing. That's what PT is all about, giving back to others and make sure that it's a lifelong learning experience for us to go out there and continue to showcase and show others how we can be the best version of ourselves. Folks, enjoy the rest of this week and we will see you next time. Have a good day. Have a good night. Have a great life and continue to take your steps to greatness to be the best version of you. We'll see you next week. Peace.